A Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court. Chapter 4. Sir Dinadin the Humorist. It seemed to me that this quaint lie was most simply and beautifully told, but then I had heard it only once, and that makes a difference. It was pleasant to the others when it was fresh, no doubt. Sir Dinadin the Humorist was the first to awake, and he soon roused the rest with a practical joke of sufficiently poor quality. He tied some metal mugs to a dog's tail and turned him loose, and he tore around and around the place in a frenzy of delight. With all the other dogs bellowing after him and battering and crashing against everything that came in their way and making altogether a chaos of confusion and a most deafening din and turmoil, in which every man and woman of the multitude laughed till the tears flowed and some fall out of their chairs and wild out on the floor in ecstasy. It was just like so many children. Sir Dinadu was so proud of his exploit that he could not keep from telling over and over again the weariness how the mortal idea happened to occur to him. As in the way it was humorous of his breed, he was still laughing at it after everyone else had got through. He was so set up that he concluded to make a speech, of course, a humorous speech. I think I never heard so many old played-out jokes sung together in my life. He was worse than the minstrels, worse than the clown and the circus. It seemed peculiarly sad to sit here, thirteen hundred years before I was born, and listen again to poor, flat, worm-eaten jokes that had given me the dry gripes when I was a boy, thirteen hundred years afterwards. It about convinced me that there isn't any such thing as a new joke possible. Everybody laughed at these antiquities, but then they always do, I noticed that, centuries later. However, of course, the scoffer didn't laugh. I mean the boy. No, he scoffed. There wasn't anything he wouldn't scoff at. He said that most of Sir Dinogen's jokes were rotten, and the rest were petrified. And I said, petrified was good, as I believed myself that the only right way to classify the majestic ages of some of those jokes was by geological periods. But that neat idea had the boy in a black place, for geology hadn't been invented yet. However, I make a note of the remark, and calculated to educate the Commonwealth up to it if I pulled through. It is no use to throw a good thing away merely because the market isn't ripe yet. Now Sir Kay arose and began to fire up on his history mill with me for fuel. It was time for me to feel serious, and I did. Sir Kay told of how he had encountered me in a fair land of barbarians who all wore the same ridiculous garb that I did, a garb that was a work of enchantment and intended to make the wearer secure from hurt by human hands. However, he had nullified the force of the enchantment by prayer, and had filled my thirteen knights in a three hours battle, and taken me prisoner, and spared my life in order that so strange curiosity as I was be exhibited to the wonder and admiration of the king in a court. He spoke of me all the time in the blandest way as this prodigious giant, and this horrible sky-towering monster, and... This tossed and Helen man devouring ogre. And everybody took in all this bosh in a naivest way, and never smiled or seemed to notice that there was any discrepancy between these watered statistics and me. He said that in trying to escape from him, I sprang into the top of a tree two hundred cubits high in a single bound, but he dislodged me with a stone the size of a cow, which all to breast the most of my bones, and then swore me to appear at Arthur's court for sentence. He ended by condemning me to die by noon on the 21st, and was so a little concerned about it that he stopped to yawn before he knew the date. I was in a dismal state by this time. Indeed, I was hardly enough in my right mind to keep the run of the dispute that sprung up as to how I had better be killed, the possibility of the killing being doubted by some, because of the enchantment in my clothes. And yet it was nothing but an ordinary suit of $15 slop shops. Still, I was sane enough to notice this detail, to wit, many of the terms used in the most matter-of-fact way by this great assemblage of first ladies and gentlemen in the land would have made a commensurate blush. Indelicacy is too mild a term to convey the idea. However, I had read Tom Jones and Ra Aldrich Random, 
You know, the books of that kind, and knew that the highest and first ladies of gentlemen in England had remained no little or no cleaner in their talk, and in the morals and conduct which such talk implies clear up to a hundred years ago, in fact, clear into our nineteenth century, in which century, broadly speaking, the examples of the real lady and real gentleman discoverable in his history, or in European history, for that matter, may be said to have made their appearance. Supposedly Sir Walter, instead of putting the conversations into the mouths of his characters, has allowed the characters to speak for themselves. We should have heard that talk from Rebecca and Ivanhoe and the sweet oft lady who went it, which would embarrass a tramp in our day. However, to the unconscious and delicate, all things are delicate. King Arthur's people were not aware that they were indecent, and I had presence of mind not enough not to mention it. They were so troubled about my enchanted clothes that they were mighty relieved at last when old Merlin swept the difficulty away for them with a common sense hint. He asked them why they were all so dull. Do I didn't it occur to them to strip me? In half a minute I was as naked as a pair of tongs, and dear, dear, to think of it, I was only the most uh, embarrassed person there. Everybody discussed me and did, did it as unconcernedly as if I had been a cabbage. Queen Guinevere was as naively interested as the rest, and said she had never seen anybody with legs just like mine before. It was the only compliment I got, if it was a compliment. Finally, I was carried off in one direction, and my perilous clothes in another. I was shoved into a dark and narrow cell in a dungeon, with some scant remnants for dinner, some moldy straw for a bed, and no end of rats for company. A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court, Chapter 4, Sir Dinadin the Humorist.